Hello everyone, my name is Adrian Verla Uchida and I'm here to share with you about my teacher journey for the Teacher Journeys Conference Fall 2021, finding yourself and your people during a pandemic. I hope that through sharing my experiences and my reflections and my critical incidents over the past year and a half, um, that you too can find, feel a sense of camaraderie or find common points and contextualize it into your journey as well. So to begin, my main themes are motherhood and academia. They're the two parts of my identity that are at the forefront of my life right now. And Ma Carol Mung Giddings in 1998 said, and found in her research that motherhood and academia when combined are a lethal cocktail. And I don't think that that's an overstatement, especially during a global pandemic. The challenges that I have faced, um, I think were made more obvious and made more challenging because of this pandemic that we're all facing right now. Now, challenges of motherhood and working mothers has been around for a long time. Um, and in Japan specifically, research has been done um, that addresses this issue. Diane Nagatomo and Melody Cook have found in their research that many women face daily struggles jug juggling their work and family. And Diane Nagatomo also found that balancing married life and professional life may be one of the greatest obstacles for working women in Japan. And part of this is due to the traditional gender roles that still permeate through society in Japan um, and other places around the world, of course, but my context here is Japan, so that's why I'm focusing on Japan. Um, here, while changing little by little, the dominant perception is that women are in the home and the men go out to work. Now, there are more double income families these days, and quite a lot of women do go back into the workforce if they've stayed home once their children enter school. Um, but that is a recent and slow change. Um, so for me, I went back to full-time work seven months after my daughter was born. And so this is my story. And it was unknown territory in many different ways. I was a first time mom, as I said, I didn't know what it would be like to work full time and try to take care of my daughter. Um, my husband also was working full time. And so I didn't know how that balance would be um, because it was the first time. So when I put on my suit um, on April 1st and I got my daughter ready for her first full day of daycare, um, I knew what I knew was that we were in the middle of a global pandemic. I knew that I was going to be starting classes um, on April 20th, a shift of about two weeks, but that classes were still expected to be held face to face. And I, what I knew was I had to walk my daughter to daycare every morning before I went to work starting on April 1st. It was a 20 minute walk there and back. And um, then I would have to go to work myself. So that I knew and I was ready for. But what I wasn't ready for was the push to move classes to May 11th and the start of emergency remote teaching or teaching online as it would become. And I also wasn't expecting the daycares to close due to the pandemic. For more, a more detailed explanation of my first semester um, of reflections on my first semester of online teaching, you can check out Verla Uchida 2020. Um, and I gave a talk at last year's Teacher Journeys Conference about it. But today I'm going to give you more of an overview and focus on specific critical incidents that I experienced over this past year and a half and share about those in more detail. So 
the personal and the professional, they collided. Um, on April 9th, when the daycares announced that they were closing due to COVID indefinitely, and the email came that said, you're going to be teaching online. Classes will not begin on April 20th, they'll begin on May 11th. And it was then that I realized I wouldn't be able to compartmentalize my life as much as I thought I would. Um, these two facets of my life, mother and teacher academic had just collided. And that's where they've remained since then in a lot of ways. Now in the top picture, um, in the right-hand side, you can see my daughter at seven months. Um, a seven-month-old can't do very much by themselves. Um, she could lay on her stomach. She could lay on her back. Um, she could hold some toys, but that was about it. So I had to make all the food for her. I had to play with her and I say had, but I wanted to do those things. Of course, she's my daughter. I'm her mom, but, um, I had to do all those things while also working during the work day. And you can see there, like there were times when she wouldn't let me put her down. So I had to put her in the carrier and hold her until she fell asleep. And then I had to keep her there and try to get as much work done as I could in that time. Now, that was the first time the daycares closed for about a month. The second time the daycares closed was this past summer. And in the picture right above there, next to my head, you can see my daughter has gotten much older. She is now in that picture about two years old. She can walk and run and play and jump and speak some English and Japanese. Um, she can make her own pizza toppings. She can, you know, she wants to do things. She's very active. She's, you know, a typical two-year-old. So it's been this interesting adjustment this whole entire time because adjusting to an infant, working at home with an infant is quite different than adjusting to working at home with a toddler. And I'm sure it's different for those that have older children as well or multiple children. So seeing the different ways that this personal and professional collide is quite interesting and quite challenging. Now, Regarding the professional element of me as a teacher, me in academia, focusing on adapting my lessons for emergency remote teaching and now what I would call more online teaching is it's not an emergency any longer. I know what's coming and my students are better prepared for what's coming than they were last April. What I knew was Google Classroom. My university had Google accounts um, for all of my students. I had been using it in previous situations as well. So I was very comfortable with Google Classroom and all of the Google products that come along with it, like Google Documents, Google Slides, Google Forms. So I immediately knew that I was going to utilize that technology in my class because I was comfortable with it. My students already had access to it. It would be crazy not to. However, what I didn't know was how to make videos like this, how to record them and upload them, how to share them. And one of the biggest things I was struggling with was how could I give my students opportunities to speak if I had to hold on-demand lessons for the majority of the class time. Now, there was no specific mandate from the university about how to teach classes, but the English section of the university had requested that we did not spend more than 20 minutes to 30 minutes at most of class on Zoom doing synchronous lessons. So two thirds of the class we needed to have asynchronous or on demand, um, or you could, break up that time in any way you saw fit. So one of my biggest challenges was how could I give my students op an opportunity to speak? And I found the app Flipgrid um, from a post on Facebook, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later, 
Um, but Flipgrid ended up being probably one of the most important tools in my online teaching belt. So adapting to emergency remote teaching was not quite the struggle I thought it would be. Um, and I'm very thankful for that because I think if it had been more of a struggle, I don't know how my life would have been because I was really pushing and stressing myself and stretching myself in every direction as it was. And I had confidence in this move to teaching with technology. So next, I would like to share with you a little bit about the daily grind, because as I said, my daughter was home with me and for the first month of online teaching or emergency remote teaching, but she did eventually go back to daycare. And Alessandra Manello has done research on how academic and professional women manage household and paid work. And during the pandemic, what her research found was the goal was to get through daily life. And I really can connect with that. Um, at the time, for whatever reason, my daughter was finding that wake ups were from five to 5.30 in the morning. Um, and there was no sleeping once she was awake. And so the morning was spent playing with her, getting her ready for daycare when she was going, getting her ready for the day and getting me ready for the day. Um, and just trying to get everyone ready. And then of course my husband was also getting ready and helping in the morning, at least with breakfast and lunch prep. So we tried to get that all done. And then Basically, when she was going to daycare from 7.45 to 8.15, I was walking her to daycare there and back. And then when I got home, I would be trying to pick up because my desk and office was my kitchen table. And so for me to have the mental space to get work done, I really needed to have the dishes done because I could see them. And if I could see them piled up, I couldn't focus. So I had to get all of that stuff done, make sure that the space around me was organized um, when my daughter wasn't home. When she was home, I knew with toys and things, it was just going to look like an explosion. Um, and you can see in the pictures, some of the chaos that was going on in my kitchen and my living room. Um, my Mornings were typically spent teaching lessons. Um, and so from nine o'clock until lunchtime, I was teaching. And then in the afternoon, if I had afternoon classes, I was teaching as well. And then I was doing grading and marking and prep work. I'm sure this is a very similar situation to all of you. And then the first semester, I tried to pick up my daughter by 4.30. So that meant I had to leave the house by four to go get her. And part of it was just, she wasn't a year old yet. And I felt this sense of guilt um, in sending her to daycare, of course, during a pandemic. I'm sure I would have felt that sense of guilt even if there were no pandemic going on. But because I was sending my baby during a pandemic, it just made me always feel this like sense of guilt. And so I tried to go get her as soon as possible. Um, to try to alleviate those feelings. Then in the evening, you know, my husband would come home, we would get dinner ready, he did help me. Um, I'm very lucky for that. Um, but we it would be the dinner bath routine. And by eight o'clock, my husband would take my daughter up to go to bed, thankfully. And then from eight o'clock, um, my second shift began. And on a good day, it finished around 11 p.m. On a bad day, it finished around two or three in the morning was the latest, but I was then getting up again to start all over at five o'clock. So it was really just getting through the day. Now, the older my daughter got, um, there were little changes that helped make my life a little easier. Um, some of the big ones was when she turned one year old, I could officially put a child seat on the back of my bicycle. You can see it in the middle 
by the 5 p.m. mark, which shortened my 20, 25 minute walking commute to a seven minute bike ride each way. So I was finding little ways to get a little more time in my day. She also was a little bit older. And so I would leave her at daycare until about five o'clock, um, occasionally 5.30. Between five and 5.30 was when I would try to go get her to give me one extra hour of time by myself to get work done. Um, and so you can see in these pictures, otherwise the time is about the same. But this past year since April, I have realized that this lethal path that I was on with this lack of sleep um, couldn't continue. And so I have made these conscious efforts to stop working at 5 p.m. and go get my daughter and to try to not do as much work on that second shift from 8.30 after she goes to bed. Um, but if I have to, I do stop working at 11 p.m. And I found that that is something that I have had to do for my mental sanity um, because I feel during this pandemic, well, I feel in life in general, like it's important to try to find a balance and it's never going to be perfect, but I couldn't keep getting a few hours of sleep a night and trying to function and do my job as a mother and my job as, you know, an educator well. Now, I've shared with you about teaching my lessons and raising my daughter and how I've tried to find a balance with that. But where I couldn't really find a balance was regarding publishing. And as many of you in academia, I'm sure are familiar with the idea of publish or perish. Um, in my situation, I'm on a contract, I have to publish. X amount of times during the contract period in order to get my contract renewed. That's one of the requirements, not the only one. However, Fredrickson said it best when she said, very little scholarly work gets done with a six-year-old underfoot. It's true with my two-year-old now. It was true when she was seven months old last spring when the pandemic started. Publishing fell by the wayside. My research fell by the wayside. I managed to give this presentation um, at Teacher Journeys, give a presentation at Teacher Journeys last year. And I was really, really proud of that fact. Um, but the idea of actually sitting down and researching about a topic was very challenging and very little of that happened in the academic 2020 year. Other scholars, Manello, who I cited earlier, um, also said the similar situation and that one of the large, the biggest things that people have been discovering is that this pandemic has had an effect on female researchers, especially in their ability to publish. And being able to publish does have short-term effects on career stability, like contract renewals, but they also can have lingering effects on a woman's career regarding promotion or even tenure. And so some places have made efforts to curtail that fact, but not everywhere. And so there is this pressure to publish or perish. And this year I'm trying to make more of an effort to get my research done. You can see one of my bookshelves filled with books and you'll see topics like communities of practice, which I'll share with you in a little bit. And um, things that are related. And I've got those books, but I just have to find time to read them. And it's really hard during a pandemic. So this, that feeling has made me feel adrift at times and it's made me feel frustrated and other things. But more than that, Teaching online during this pandemic and being here, coming back here at my kitchen table where I am right now still, has made me feel adrift. Um, before, I found energy in my classroom and I could connect with my students and get energy from them, but it's not the same on a computer screen over Zoom or on-demand lessons when they're typing answers or recording videos to Flipgrid. 
And so this feeling of being grounded in my, my place um, wasn't there and the energy wasn't coming. And I was spending every day alone at my kitchen table all day. And I'm sure that many of you can relate to this. Um, so this feeling of loneliness or feeling alone and feeling out of place um, wasn't because I was a mother really, but it was because I was teaching online during a pandemic. And so I tried to find ways to alleviate that feeling of aloneness and to try to ground myself in some way. And by doing that, I did it through my communities of practice. And so communities of practice, Winger, McDermott, and Snyder say, they're people who share common problems, concerns, passions, or goals, and strive to deepen their knowledge and expertise by engaging with each other. And that doing so offers the chance for personal growth and what Kennedy calls transformative practice. And so I reached out to my communities of practice and I got involved in new communities of practice to try to feel connected to the academic community in Japan and abroad and to kind of give myself a place beyond my kitchen table. And so for me, online communities of practice um, were really important and served as a lifeline and helped me with my teaching practice and adjusting to emergency remote teaching. Two of the groups were Facebook communities, Emergency Online Language Teaching in Japan and Online Teaching Japan. And Online Teaching Japan especially influenced me in that I discovered Flipgrid from a post that someone had written about in the spring of 2020. And that served as the springboard for me to research about it and ultimately decide to use it. And also they held um, what they called summer sessions um, in summer of 2020 and 2021. And in summer 2020, I was invited to give a talk on Flipgrid and how I used it in my classroom um, for emergency remote teaching. And it provided an opportunity for me to give back. So as I just mentioned, I wasn't publishing, but I did have a chance to give back to a community that was helping me. And I hope that through that presentation, I helped someone else to kind of pass it on. Now, I also tried to start a group with English teachers at my university because I noticed when we moved online that there was very little support in English um, for my teachers, for the teachers at my university. And so a coworker and I um, put together a bunch of materials about emergency remote teaching. We held Zoom sessions to help teachers practice using Zoom and Google Meet. And we did all these things. And in my mind, I imagined that it would be this fruitful, strong community of full-time and part-time teachers all working together in English. But as you can imagine, there just wasn't time to foster the community enough and it doesn't really exist anymore. It kind of pops up at the start of a semester when we all check in with each other and then disappears until the end of the semester when we occasionally check in with each other. And so for me, a goal for this fall semester was to restart and retry building this community. But I don't know if that's going to happen. It really will depend on, are the daycares going to keep staying open? Am I going to be working online? We're scheduled to go back to face-to-face -face lessons mid-semester. So I don't know. But I really would, if I can't figure it out this semester, hopefully next academic year, I can really work to try to build a community of practice within my university. Um, because it's very important to me to try to have, to try to give back to my communities because I'm getting so much from them. Now, prior membership and communities of practice is the other area I wanted to share with you today and how they affected me. I've been a member of JOLT, the Japan Association for Language Teaching 
since 2014 um, and a member of multiple special interest groups or SIGs. And last fall, I presented on past research before I went on maternity leave for the college and university educators, the QSIG. And as I mentioned earlier, I presented at Teacher Journeys 2020. And now I'm presenting at 2021. And these two presentations really were held within a month of each other and they were very contrasting experiences and they really affected how I was engaging with the community going forward. And so the Q conference that I attended and presented at, I gave a live or I gave a pre recorded video that was uploaded to YouTube. And then I was available for Q&A during the presentation. However, no one came to my presentation. Um, and that's okay. I mean, it's unfortunate, but it's okay. However, the conference was held on a Saturday. And so I had to make special arrangements to send my daughter to daycare for the day so that I could attend the conference and be available for Q&A and give my talk. And with no one coming to ask me any questions about my presentation, they may have viewed it on YouTube, but there was no interaction. Um, it really intensified the feeling of guilt I had for sending my daughter to daycare on a Saturday when it should be my family day with her. Um, and it connected with the research that Diane Nagatomo and Melody Cook have done where they share that women quite often feel a sense of guilt for not being able to be completely available for their children. And I also felt like I couldn't be completely available at the conference, I couldn't give 100% of myself because I was worried, you know, and feeling guilty that my daughter was at daycare and wondering if she was still taking a nap and checking the time to see how long until I could go get her. So it made me realize that, well, it's great that these online conferences exist and they do make them more accessible in some ways. The, the idea of managing one's time and values really were called into effect for me. On the flip side, the teacher development SIG had the Teacher Journeys Conference and all of the videos were uploaded to YouTube and done asynchronously. And so there was no pressure to be available for a Q&A, though, you know, I would have loved to be able to discuss about that and talk with people. They could leave comments, of course, on the YouTube video. But this style of conference really spoke to me and I felt really addressed the issues that many caretakers are facing. One, it was asynchronous. And it was done in a way that a few presentations were released weekly over the course, I believe, of six weeks. And so it was just the right amount of presentations that I could sit and watch one during my lunch break, or um, I could listen to one on the way to walk. If I walked to pick up my daughter, I could watch one of the 15, 20 minute talks. And so it really spoke to me and showed the different ways that we could adapt for, adapt to the situation. So these communities of practice were essential in helping me find myself and find my people. And I do wanna say a special thanks to Teacher Journeys and especially Mike Ellis for coordinating all of this because it really helped me feel connected. And I hope that through listening to this talk that you too could, if you're a mother or a father or a parent, um, of a child or children. I hope you can identify and you could get something from my talk. And even if you're not, um, I hope that the idea of communities of practice and the importance they can play in your professional life could inspire you to get involved in a community of practice or start your own if you don't have one. So thank you for listening to my presentation and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Goodbye.